workshop. Here we go. Okay, so um, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Um, we're here to talk about something that's really um, fundamental to a lot of your efforts, um, which is fundraising for your brigade. Um, so really excited to have members of Code for America's development team here, as well as Code for America's finance team. Um, so just want to talk about some of the um, best practices um, or suggested practices for your brigade. Um, we've been really fortunate to have members of the development team join us um, for things like Brigade Congress and fundraising office hours to um, guide brigade leaders and members through different fundraising tactics. So want to open up to a um, broad audience today and just have a general discussion. Um, in the interest of time, we won't go through and do um, introductions from everybody, um, but seeing folks here from all over, from Greenville and Nashville and Oakland, so really excited to um, have representation from a lot of um, different brigades. Um, so what we'll do is what I'd like to start with is introductions. Um, from the folks who will be presenting today. Um, so from Code for America's development team and finance team. Um, and then um, we can get into our presentation for today. Um, so Lizzie, will you kick us off? Yes, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Lizzie. I'm the Senior Manager of Institutional Partnerships at Code for America. Um, so work mainly with philanthropic partners, foundations, and corporations. I can go next. Hi, I'm Layla. Um, I really miss seeing so many of you at Summit this year. I'm Senior Director of Institutional Partnerships here at Code for America. Geneva, you want to go? Sure, yes, hi, um, my name is Geneva Morley. I'm actually new on the institutional partnerships team. Um, I'm the institutional partnerships manager, but I'm working with Lizzie and Layla and will hopefully be a resource for you all in the future as well. I go next. Hi everyone, it's so nice to um, see you all here. I am also new on the team. I am the director of individual giving and uh, my team, there's three of us and we oversee uh, individual donors. Howard. Hi, my name is Howard and I'm Director of Finance at Code for America. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you all. Um, and um, folks, we're going to have a Q&A portion of this workshop at the end. So if you do have any questions, um, you can either submit a question through the Q&A portion of the um, Zoom portal, or you can raise your hand. Um, of course, there's always the chat function, but it's a little bit harder to keep track of questions in the chat. So um, if you could please try to use the raise your hand function or the Q&A portal, that would be great. Um, so I am going to be doing the screen sharing. So Lizzie, just um, let me know um, when you want the um, slides to be advanced. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Awesome. So, um, yeah, we we'll started off doing introductions, then um, D team will do kind of an overview presentation and fundraising 101, both on the institutional side and individual side. And then Howard will jump in with some finance considerations and reminders. And then I think we'll have about 10, 15 minutes at the end for Q and A. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. Okay, awesome. So yeah, we're really excited to be with you all this afternoon. I know on the fundraising team, we are all completely in awe of the work that you all do in your brigades and have complete confidence in your ability to be awesome fundraisers. So from this workshop, we hope that you just walk away with some helpful tips and tricks how to either start fundraising with your brigade or to really bolster any existing fundraising efforts that you have. And I think we just definitely want to recognize that fundraising can be really intimidating. Um, so we're here to hopefully calm any worries or anxieties that you have around fundraising and definitely answer any questions that you have. 
So I think if nothing else, some key takeaways that we want you all to walk away from this with is first of all, please don't be intimidated. Um, as brigade leaders and members, you all already have everything that you need to be fundraisers. So much of fundraising is about having the confidence to make the ask and believing in the value of your work and the impact that you're having in your communities. So I think also because you all are so close to the projects that you're working on, you all have the information at your fingertips and it's just a matter of knowing how to make the ask and who to ask and having the confidence to do it. I think the other really important thing to remember is that fundraising is ultimately about relationships. So as volunteers who are already engaged in all of your communities, you have this built in existing network. And to the extent that you can leverage that network that you already have, whether it's from your job or the larger civic tech community, whether it's from your personal life or school, all of these relationships that you already hold can really be helpful in fundraising. Um, I think the third main takeaway is that you are not gonna get anything unless you ask. So as fundraisers, we are taught to make an ask and be as specific and as direct as possible. Um, so whether you're preparing to meet with an individual who you think might be a potential donor or let's say you secured a call with like a program officer at a local community foundation, you want to go into the call or meeting with a plan to make an ask. So like an example of that in practice is, would you consider donating to our brigade at the $100 level? And then you wait. And Layla is particularly good at the awkward silence that follows from there and letting it last for as long as it needs to. But you just wait and you let the awkward silence pass and you don't say a thing and you let them respond. Um, and finally, I think don't feel guilty. Um, and that's something that, you know, I had to wrap my head around a lot as when I first started fundraising is like, Money is weird and everybody has a weird relationship with money. And um, when it comes to fundraising for your brigade, you just need to set that personal stuff aside and recognize, take pride in your work and recognize that people are not gonna give you money if they don't want to. <laughs> like you are going to make them ask and you're probably gonna be rejected. Like everyone on the development team is rejected on a weekly basis. And you just smile and you say thank you and I look forward to keeping you updated on our work. And it's not a personal thing, um, it's just going into the conversation with the confidence that you know that you all are having an incredible impact in your community. So I think those are just like some general tips and tricks. Um, Layla and Jason, anything to add there? No, that was great. I just want to emphasize just be as proud to fundraise for your work as you are of the work that you're doing because it really is amazing. Just had to unmute there. That was really great, Lizzie, because um, I'm, I'm seeing this for the first time and I'm seeing how many overlaps there are with individual giving too. Mm -hmm. And I just want to echo 100% the part of not feeling guilty. Um, and again, building relationship. It's really 99% percent relationship building and then the ask is just that one minute of your time of your of, of, of the relationship and then you move on and then you just got to trust that people will do what is right for them uh, their foundation their family and the important thing is to continue to engage them with the work thank you that's a good way to put it Jason awesome um next slide please Um, I thought it might be helpful to give kind of an overview of the donor engagement cycle or a fundraising cycle. As a fundraising team, this is sort of how we frame our work and it's sort of a place where we put each of our relationships throughout the cycle. So it's a way for both the institutional team and the individual team to kind of measure and assess how many donors or funders we have in the cultivation stage or how many are ready for solicitation. And the goal is always to sort of move the individual or the funder through the cycle. So I'll just give you, um, you know, five minute 
or less overview of the cycle. So the first step is research and identification. So this means, you know, spending time weeding out from the thousands of foundations and hundreds of thousands of potential donors there are who may be potentially interested in supporting your brigade. And it's narrowing down this huge list. So you can do it in a number of ways. You can do it first by focus area. So let's say your brigade is working on um, a project in partnership with like a local food bank and you're working on reducing food insecurity in your community, then you'll want to find foundations who care about food access and food insecurity or individuals. You can also narrow it down um, and do prospect research by geography. A lot of foundations and corporations and individuals really give locally. So finding, doing some prospect research about groups or people in your community is also another way to do research and identify those who might be a really good match. Um, the next stage is cultivation, which is about building that relationship. So it's about reaching out, getting a call, sending an email, really starting to build the relationship. That's the foundation of fundraising. So you can cultivate individuals and donors in a lot of different ways, um, but it's pretty much just about like telling the story of your work and also finding out what that individual or that foundation cares about. Cause that's when like the magic happens when those two things meet. Um, so if the goal is like to get food donated for your brigade, then the cultivation step can be pretty simple. You know, it just, it could be even be like an intro paragraph in an email telling about what your brigade does and the impact that you're having on the community. If you're talking about like a foundation, the cultivation stage is much longer. Um, the next step is solicitation. So that's the ask. And as I mentioned before, it should be direct and specific with um, most likely some kind of an awkward silence at the end, but you have to make the ask. Um, the next step in the cycle is acknowledgement. And to me, it's one of the most important things that we do as fundraisers. You have to acknowledge the gift and thank the donor or the funder over and over again. And I think this is really critical because this is what can kind of mean the difference between a one-time donor or a funder who funds you once and someone who funds you for the rest of their lives. So it's about really strengthening that relationship and making sure that the donor feels appreciated and that their gift is really valued. So um, like a handwritten thank you note is always nice or an email or a call, but I think acknowledging the gift is really, really important. And I think connected to that is engagement. So after a donor has made um, a donation or after you've gotten a grant from a foundation or an in-kind donation, let's say from a corporation. So it's just keeping these individuals excited about their work, about your work. So it's sending them email updates. It's inviting them to any events. It's saying, hey, look, we just launched a new project. Like here's a local news story about it. Thank you for making this work possible. It's just continuing to strengthen the relationship and keeping them engaged and sort of bringing them along um, on the journey so that they feel like they're an integral part of the projects that you're building. And finally, stewardship, you know, is connected to that. It's just further strengthening the relationship by recognizing their donation and engaging them further. And then renewal is when you start the whole process over again, um, usually like it's an annual renewal um, and you start to prepare to make the ask again. So that hopefully that's just helpful for kind of the ideal cycle that a donor or a foundation will go through. Um, anything there, Layla or Jason, that you wanted to add? No, that was great, Lizzie. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So now um, I just wanted to dive in a little bit deeper into institutional fundraising. Um, and by institutional, we mean foundations and corporations mainly. There are definitely, um, you know, plus and minuses to institutional fundraising. So I think 
as you think about weighing whether your brigade is ready to start doing more institutional fundraising, I just wanted to highlight some benefits and some drawbacks. Um, the first thing I think that's really great about institutional fundraising is that you can raise um, a lot of money. You know, you can raise four figure, five figure, six figure gifts um, because foundations are required to distribute 5% of their assets every year. So it's a philanthropic arm that is set up for the sole purpose of giving money away to nonprofits like yourselves. Um, and that's another thing that I think I really like about institutional fundraising is that when you're having a conversation with a program officer or let's say you submit like a letter of interest, we're all like all actors in that are on the same page about why this is happening, right? Like they have a role, which is to give away money and we have a role, which is to ask for money. So that kind of takes away some of the awkwardness because we all know what our roles are in the whole process. Um, I think if you're doing work in a particular focus area and you're able to find a funder who cares about that focus area, you can really build like authentic, strong relationships, um, which is another great thing I think about institutional fundraising is like that moment where your focus area or whatever application or project you're building matches completely with the focus area of a foundation. Um, at Code for America, we have like a f one foundation who's been funding our Get Cal Fresh work for a number of years, and they they care about increasing access to SNAP in the Bay Area. So it's just like it's a it's such a lovely relationship because we both like appreciate each other and we have the same focus areas. And I think when you can find that connection, it's just it can be really great. Um, and finally, I think another great thing about institutional fundraising is that. A lot of foundations support organizations for a number of years. So it's a lot of work on the front end, but it pays off because oftentimes if you can secure a grant with a foundation, then it's it's money that you can count on year after year. I think um, on the flip side, there are definitely some downsides to institutional fundraising that I think it's important to keep in mind when you're deciding whether you want to go down that route. Um, and I think the biggest one is that it's a ton of work, right? So the, pro the application process can be really long. You oftentimes have to submit, um, you know, a letter of interest and then a proposal, oftentimes a budget. So it's definitely time con consuming, which can be a drawback, um, especially for volunteers like yourselves. I think another challenge that comes with institutional fundraising is that often foundations want to fund like a particular project or just a particular focus area. So um, it's changing a little bit, I think in the philanthropic field, but hopefully there's a little bit of a shift, but I think historically foundations just have their certain areas of focus or issues that they care about and they don't really wanna fund anything outside of that. Um, so like if your brigade has is working on two projects, you might find a foundation who really wants to fund just one of those and then it can be difficult to like parse out your time or supplies or materials and kind of like extrapolate the two projects from each other. Um, so I think that's that might be another downside for institutional funding for brigades. Um, and funding from individuals, which Jason can talk about a little bit more in a little bit, is it's just often way more flexible in that regard. So I think a few ways to think about institutional fundraising, um, you know, the first is like, do you have a mission statement? Um, most foundation applications are going to ask you to have kind of gone through the exercise of coming up with a mission and a vision statement. So you'll want a mission statement is what you do, it's your statement of values and what you're looking to accomplish. And a vision statement is sort of the world that you're trying to create with your work. So it's a statement of if your mission succeeds, then what the world will look like. So for example, at Code for America, you know, we believe government services can and should be simple, beautiful, and easy to use. Um, they should, outcomes can be better better can cost less, and most importantly, people who access government services can and should be treated with respect and dignity. So it's a visionary statement of like, once we have succeeded, this is what government services will look like. 
Um, so I think if you're interested in going down the institutional road, you'll want to spend some time kind of thinking through those. If you haven't already, it might be helpful to come up with like a one pager, a two pager um, that outlines your mission and vision, as well as kind of a statement of need or a problem statement that your projects are working to address. And that way, it's not only like a helpful thought exercise to go through, but you can also use pull from that once you get to the stage of submitting a letter of interest or a proposal. Um, Leila, anything to add there about kind of institutional fundraising and, and what brigades might find most helpful? Yeah, I would say um, one really important thing about institutional fundraising is going back to the key part of relationships. Um, like who in your network has relationships and who can you talk to before you submit any grant application, it's always best to try to talk to the program officer um, and to get aligned so that you don't waste your time. Because as Leslie put here, like someone on, ideally on the brigade should be dedicated to this, dedicated to doing the proposals, um, make sure you have accountability because there will be reports to do. You'll have to do sort of regular check-ins. So just make sure that you are, um, you have the capacity to follow through after the money is raised. I think it's an important point. Um, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I think also just, I just wanted to highlight um, a resource and then Jason can jump in and talk a little bit more about individuals. So most family foundations and small community foundations don't have websites. So it can be really hard to find who are these funders in our community who are funding these types of projects. Um, Foundation Directory Online is something that we use um, a lot at Code for America to do a lot of prospect research. Um, they also, it's a nonprofit run by Foundation Center. Um, they also have a lot of really good fundraising trainings. Um, and you often need a subscription for a foundation directory online, but it's free at public libraries. So you can go in and write in like what city you're in and what your focus area is. So if it's food insecurity or food access, you just write food access and then the city and um, a list of foundations that fund in that area will pop up. Um, so I think you can get access to it at libraries and then also um, if any of you you know just want to pull a list I, you can email me and I would be happy to just pull a list from you for you from foundation directory online um, okay I think that's it for institutional Jason you do you want to jump in and do some in talking about individual fundraising sure thank you Great. Um, I'll move the slide forward. Um, I also just want to let folks know that I see a couple questions coming in the Q&A, um, but I can't see them until I stop my screen sharing. So just a reminder that we'll have a Q&A section at the end um, and we'll be able to get to those questions then. Thanks. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so individual fundraising, individual giving, it's definitely, there's, there's many overlaps with institutions, specifically with the relationship side of it. It's um, relationship building, essentially. But something to keep in mind is that these are personal finances. These are people's personal bank accounts. This is money coming out of their savings and their investments to give to something that is beyond themselves and beyond their family. And so that is very powerful in a way because we're looking, we're, we're assuming a couple of things. We're assuming that people are generous um, and that they want to do good and that they are going to do good to leave, you know, a society that is better um, for their children and better for the next generation. So really, I invite all of you to really sink on that and really, um, approach individual fundraising with an assumption that is real, is that people are generous um, and that people give to people. And it's really our role to really um, engage them to the point where they feel comfortable and they feel confident in the mission and, they, and, they, and that they will continue to give to you and the mission that you're doing. Um, and I, the first bullet point here, affinity, access, ability, 
So once you, you know, empower yourself with these, these thoughts about individual giving, um, where do you go from there? Like who makes the best prospect? Who makes the best donors? And so really think about these three A's before you, you start to approach someone. Um, affinity, how are they close to you? How are they close to the work that you're doing? How are they close to um, the individual projects that you're doing? If, if not, how can you engage them further to further uh, amplify their affinity? Access, how do you access them? Can you give them a call right away and schedule a meeting or do you need to go through someone else? Um, ability, right? In some ways you can't really, um, you, you shouldn't approach them quite yet if they're not in the position to give now, uh, but maybe later that you can. And so at any given time for any individual person, really assess these three A's and how you could get them closer. How can you increase and amplify these three elements in order to make them a, a good prospect. Um, to, to go further into these three concepts, right, you have to, you can't, you can't have one and not the other. Um, you can't approach a donor if they can't, if, 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 if they don't have the ability to give. You, you can't approach a donor if you can't get in front of them. So definitely think about all these three things, assess them along the way. Um, and then this is another term too that in, in during individual giving, we, we tend to um, really talk about is seek advice, get money twice. You can't just ask for a gift right away because this is a, people are giving through you and not to the mission and that they are essentially making a misinformed decision. They're, they're making an incomplete decision because you haven't had a chance to wow them yet. You haven't had a chance to engage them yet. So going back to what Lizzie said earlier, the cultivation part of it is, is the most creative part of it, but it could also take quite some time because you're going through several meetings, you're doing an RF, uh, RFP, and you're introducing them to other people that might be of interest to them. And during that time, you're really seeking their advice. You're asking them, um, what is their philosophy around giving? What is it that they think about Code for America, the work that you're doing is so compelling and that they want to be part of? And so by the time you get to that solicitation, even though you are being specific and you are being very firm and with confidence, when you're doing that, it shouldn't be a surprise because you have been doing the work in the beginning to get you there. Um, and by that time, for example, you know that they could give, you have access to them, um, and that you're really just really testing their affinity. Um, and if you do your cultivation um, correctly, then you know that they are ready to make that gift and should not become a surprise at all. Um, when it comes to individual giving, whether you're fundraising for an organization or for yourself or for your family, it really does start with your own network um, and what is existing already. So for Code for America, you know, my job now, even though I'm new, but I am in inheriting existing donors and your previous donors will always make the best donors. They may give a dollar, but it doesn't mean that they can't give more. It doesn't mean that they can't give 10 to 20 times more than that, do that, that dollar. It just means that they, uh, they already know a certain level of the, or of the organization, so you don't have to identify too much. Um, and you know, I, you know, as, as, as I was thinking this um, for the Brigade Network, I, you know, I, I do see that you have to look, you have to start with your network and people that you know who, for example, you have access to, who are fellow technologists, who are very interested in government, who are interested in scaling. Who are those people in your network and how can you start to engage them? And again, it's not asking them for a gift right away. It's about learning about their interests, their philanthropy, um, philosophy per se. And then you wanna start anywhere online, either it's on your, your LinkedIn, your Facebook, I put diary here, but I really meant your, 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 um, your um, phone book. Um, and then I also wanted to leave here you with something to continue reading about. Um, this, this, this is the link to a blog post about how to really start framing your, your mind about identifying, qualifying, and segmenting donors, because it could be overwhelming. Um, it, it could be very overwhelming. So you want to really always put your best prospect and your best donor first. Um, and then work your way down because you want to be very strategic about who you approach first, usually the person with the highest capacity to kind of set a certain momentum. Um, because yes, people give to people and, and but, pe but giving is also very contagious. And so the more you have to start off with, the more, the bigger momentum you have, 
and the more you will be able to tell that story and inspire others to give at the same time. And, you know, Lizzie mentioned some challenges with individual giving is, is the biggest thing that comes to mind really is that it's, it's, it's an art, right? We, 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 we try our best to make our decisions and make our strategies evidence-based, but at the end of the day, it's definitely an art because someone could have the highest affinity for your work, they're your best friend, they're your best donor, and they have capacity up the wazoo, but they're, they're, you have to be nimble and you have to be very creative and be very donor-centric because one day you might schedule a meeting and you're ready to make an ask, they're ready to make an ask, but an accident happens, for example, at home. You wanna be mindful of that, you wanna be nimble about that, you wanna be creative and you wanna pivot, um, be very patient with the donor. A lot of times too, Code for America being so multifaceted, we have so many different projects happening that in my experience, for example, you might cultivate for one type of project, but the donor might change their mind and they wanna give you something else. So you wanna be very creative about that and be very, and, and let the donor lead there and just really be a convener um, of the relationship and helping engage them throughout the entire process and helping them make a, an informed decision that they uh, feel confident about and also feel really good about because if they feel good about this decision, the next decision will be easier. Anything else um, I should add? Leela, Lizzie, Veronica? No, that was great. That uh, was great. Great. Thank you, Jason. Um, let me go to finance considerations and reminders. Um, let me see, Howard, are you available? I, I think he messaged and said he was having some internet issues, um, but I couldn't really take a look because I am sharing my screen. Um, yeah. But I will assume that's the case. I'm here. Oh, can okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right. Good. It's just that I don't know what's going on with my internet. Um, so I'm just going to talk about three different areas, fiscal sponsorship, agreements and donations. Um, and I'll keep it brief. Fiscal sponsorship is meaning that the brigade is operating underneath the designation that Code for America has obtained. And terminology is 501c3. And all that means is with a nonprofit or a charitable organization, and we're exempt from federal taxes. Um, to the brigade, that just means that we're handling all the money, all the funds, we're taking care of all the filing and um, any legal paperwork that needs to be done. Um, now I should say that's only for the ones that we provide, <coughs> excuse me, fiscal sponsorship services for. If you have your own fiscal sponsor, then somebody else is doing that for you. Um, and then if you're your own nonprofit, then you're doing this on your own. Um, then in terms of agreements, any agreements that we get enter into, this means um, any contracts, any proposals, um, any contracts, a proposal, um, they have to be signed by CFA staff. And there's a link that you can use um, to contact Brigades to get more information on that. Um, last thing is donations. Um, no matter what the amount, they should be submitted to CFA. And you can do this using the website. And the purpose is the donors have to be acknowledged. And if it goes through the website, they will be acknowledged. Um, and then the last thing, if you're, if you're in it, entering into any agreements that require what we call an exchange, in other words, they want something for the money, not just they're providing you a donation that allows you to do your work, then you need to contact CFA, probably development in advance. And I think that's it. 
Great, thank you, Howard. Um, and just also, um, I think that one of the important parts of this slide is that we are here to help you um, with kind of the back end parts of what goes along with um, raising funds for your brigade. Um, and so um, we ask that you loop us into the process as early as possible so that we can work with you um, in order to make sure that um, we're able to abide by all of the um, rules and regulations that that we need to um, as your fiscal sponsor. Okay, great. So this um, leads us into our question and answer portion. Um, so we will start with our first question of Tim from Nashville asks, will you share the slides after? Yes, so what we'll do is we'll um, have this as a discourse post like we do for the rest of our monthly workshops and we'll provide the video for this workshop as well as a link to the slides. Um, and also we'll post, um, we have a number of resources um, around fundraising and um, the financial um, aspects of, of what you need to do after you raise funds. So we will post all of that information as part of the discourse post. Um, and then Alex says, love this. What help can you provide such as a list of funders slash grant programs? Will you write a letter of support? Um, we're not professional fundraisers, y'all are. Um, so I think Lizzie that you um, address this by providing a link to the um, funding solutions. I forget the exact name, um, but I guess, um, can you expand on this question at all? Yeah, sure. So um, Foundation Directory Online is very user-friendly. If you go to a public library, um, you should be able to just log in and search based off any criteria that you um, want to focus on. And I think um, if you do have problems with that or for some reason you're not able to access it, then I am happy to um, pull a list from Foundation Center. Um, if you just like give me, you know, like your city and what the focus areas are, I'm happy to do that. Um, as far as drafting, I don't think we can really draft, but I um, <laughs> am happy to like help workshop a mission statement or um, any, a vision statement. Um, and, you know, if it's like, a one pager and you're like, can you just do, you know, a quick 10 minute review? Is this missing anything? Like, I think I'm, I think we're happy to do that. We just don't have a ton of extra capacity, but I think if it's a one off here or you find like a request for proposals that looks really awesome and just want like some quick feedback, we're happy to do that. I think we just can't get um, too much in the habit of like doing a lot of writing of proposals as much as we would like to. I will add that we have a template for um, an in-kind request letter. I think this one is particularly focused on getting food, which is, may not be as relevant um, today. Hopefully in the future it will be, but um, there are a lot of really great resources about writing letters of interest and templates for ways to do this. So we're happy um, to think of creative ways that we can provide more resources like that, that you could all customize for your individual brigades. In fact, like a list of needs would be really helpful as the D team. Um, so if you all like surface those, it would help us better understand how we can support you. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. And in the discourse post that um, that's created out of this workshop, um, I think that's a great folks, um, a great place for folks that are watching this to be able to um, make a list of things that might be helpful um, so we can collect those. Um, Alex, you also said the FDO is a beast. Could you make some recs? I think Lizzie addressed that and said that yes, if there is something that um, some fundraising that you're looking to do, she'd be happy to pull um, some folks that are um, a, equipped to be able to take those um, Sorry, I'm, I'm totally We could also this. maybe do like a future just foundation center um, that might be helpful for everyone because I know when you go in and you're like, I care about food, food security in LA, they're like, there are 10,000 foundations supporting food security in LA, but we can help you think through how to filter those and, and target the best ones. Um, and Alex was asking about letter of support. I think we just mean like a letter asking for money or describing the program that you're doing. Um, just depends on the, the use case. Great. 
Um, Tim asks, what if a governor partner wants, government partner wants to sponsor a project? Does that require a CFA signature? It sort of sounds like a project specific donation, but I'm not sure. Howard, do you want to answer that one? I would say it depends. If we're the fiscal sponsor, then yes, it does require CFA uh, signature. Yeah, and I think that guidance goes in general. If, if anybody is looking to sponsor um, the brigade or a project, um, or if anything requires a signature to move forward in a contractual sense, then that requires a, um, a signature from Code for America staff. I also um, want to mention just something about government funding. Uh, government, I don't know how many brigades are actually like doing government contracts, but it is like a significant amount of work on the organization and you need to have certain structures in place to track things like people's time, um, etc. So I would just caution everyone that I think government revenue is an interesting revenue opportunity, but really like go in eyes wide open about the work that it's going to take. Oh, and Thad, is Foundation Center still scary for Code for Boston? Maybe he'll, he'll type back and let us know. That was his question. He said it was, well, not a question. He said it was scary at first. <laughs> Code for Boston. Okay, Thad asked, are there topics that you use? I think I would need clarification. If you, if you mean in Foundation Center, um, it depends on what program we're researching. I mean, you can go as broad as like criminal justice and then as narrow as like tech programs in jails. Um, so it really depends. But if you, if when you get into Foundation Center, actually I've spent a lot of time in my career like reading through every single possible line of like interest areas because it's kind of interesting all of the things that um, these foundations support. Cool. Um, Greg from Miami asks, what if you are a 501c3 as a strategic partner with CFA? Um, so he's referring to the relationship to Code for America being a partner brigade. Um, and your funder decided to fund CFA through your work. How do you leverage that relationship as a win for more funding for your brigade? Curious on thoughts. I think that you leverage this as um, like, in communities and on the ground, brigades are like, you're the leaders, you're blazing the way for this work to happen, I think in a nimble and more flexible way than sometimes an organization like Code for America can. So I think you leverage this and that like your work is directly inspiring and scaling and enhancing the work of Code for America. I would really leverage that connection point. And also I would leverage your unique, your uniqueness because you're serving Miami in a way that Code for America will never be able to. You have local context and understanding of the nuances that we will never be able to. Um, so leveraging that particularly for funders who care about places because that's somewhere where Code for America struggles a lot where we are a national organization and funders really like a lot of attention on the cities and deep work in the cities that they care about. So I would position yourself as like that core, core partner. And um, Gregory, you like, we owe you so much gratitude and thanks. I know. And if you ever want to like talk offline, we are more than happy um, to brainstorm this one with you. Awesome. Does anyone else have any further questions? Okay, Bonnie. It is my understanding that in California, that if an org has a contract with any city, that other cities don't have to go through the same contract negotiations, but rather can just use the same contracts that has already been approved by using same terms. Are there contracts that CFA has with cities in California, um, example, design thinking workshops, et cetera, that might be useful for brigades in California to leverage? 
I do not know the answer to this. I think we can definitely do some research and find out. I do know that Code for America has a contract at the state level with the California Department of Social Services, which is very specific to our Get Cal Fresh um, project. So that, that isn't a contract that could be leveraged. But I know in the past as an organization, we've done things like um, user-centered design workshops for workforce agencies. So let us do some research and get back to you because I actually think, Bonnie, that's a really, um, that's just a super interesting way for brigades to not only like advance the mission and the impact, but also to get some revenue opportunities. So we'll, we'll ask with finance. Okay, I will um, leverage the awkward silence for one more minute to see if anyone else has any um, further questions. Rana, can I just put in a, a plug for the individual giving team? I think, um, you know, as a, a, we're here also as a resource as well. So after you think about your network and think about um, the folks, the individuals that are in your network who could potentially um, be interested in being engaged more and ultimately giving to your brigade and your work. Um, we're more than happy to sit down and brainstorm with you and help you uh, cultivate these relationships. Great, thank you. Um, I, yeah. uh, can I add one more thing? Yeah. Um, I just want to do a plug for the fundraising hours. If you have specific like fundraising strategies or ideas that you want to workshop and um, think about more deeply with us. I think we're holding them quarterly. Um, I'm not sure when the next ones are, but we, um, those are also a resource to get more specific about your brigade's fundraising needs. Yeah, that's great. Um, I also want to highlight on the individual giving side. Um, I know that some brigades have with, um, with pretty great success sent out emails to individuals as, also, as well as doing um, Facebook posts. Um, I think it incorrects me um, if I mess this up, but Jen said something about how fundraising um, sh shouldn't be an intimidating. It should be more an invitation for the people that you know to be part of the work that you do and be proud of the work that you're doing. Um, and so I think that's a really great way to think about putting the ask out there, especially in a broader sense, um, through email or through social media. Um, and so um, we um, were able to um, help provide um, templates um, through the D team um, for some emails um, and social media asks um, during the holidays that were really successful. So want to just plug that as a resource that will be part of the discourse post. Um, but I think that that's a creative way to think about um, looking at individual fundraising from um, people that you know in your networks as well. Okay, great. Um, oh, one more question, Thad. Oh, sure. So Thad's asking a question about the structure of the development team. Um, so is anyone able to give a little bit of insight into that? Yeah, I can cover that one. Um, so the development team, we have a interim head of development right now who um, will be leaving us at the end of May. And the organization is actually hiring a new chief revenue officer as we've just gotten a new CEO. Um, and underneath that interim head of development is the individual team led by Jason, who's the director and he has two colleagues um, underneath them, Tanya and Dana, who are wonderful. Um, and then we have the institutional team, which I lead. And then I have Lizzie and Geneva supporting me on that. And I will say that, um, like we are a much bigger team than we have been in the last like year and a half, two years. And we're all relatively new and we're all also like navigating this new normal in this crisis. So um, just unknown times ahead, but know that we are all um, here for you and really excited to support the work that you're doing and that we are very personally inspired um, by it. And we, and I don't know if you, you hear it enough or your ears turn around, but we are always talking about the amazing work that you're doing. 
Great. Well, I think that's a great opportunity to say thank you so much um, to everyone on this call and everyone on the development team, Lizzie, Jason, Layla, Geneva, Howard. I um, really appreciate the work that you do. Um, just to be fully transparent, the development team has always been extremely eager to be able to help out um, where possible in talking um, to brigade members and leaders and, and supporting the work that we're doing. So really excited about that relationship. Um, please look out for more fundraising office hours where you can um, have more in-depth conversations um, with folks and um, and please reach out if you have any questions and um, we're here to support you and also know that a lot of questions come up about what happens after we raise money or what are the logistical um, sides of things as we're looking to raise money um, and so the um, finance team um, Howard um, and the rest of the team are also here to support you um, and we're here to support you um, on the network team of course so um, let us know if you have any questions um, we'll be posting this and we'll post in the brigade channel once um, this video and other resources are up on the discourse post um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening thank right. you so much Veronica thank thanks you. Veronica thanks bye, everyone thanks Veronica bye bye everyone. bye